All right, as we continue on our study of Genesis here, um, we are now wrapping up with chapter 11, which would be the last chapter of the primeval history of Earth. As stated previously in the first video, Genesis is split up into two parts, the primeval history, and then you have the history of the patriarchs. And after chapter 11, we'll begin to go into the history of the patriarchs themselves. But beforehand, let's take a look at chapter 11. So chapter 11 picks up here, it's after the flood. And as we know, after the end of chapter 10, it shared it with us the genealogy of Noah's sons and who came forth from them. And who came forth from them would be the rest of humanity. And at the time, as according to chapter 11, humanity spoke the same language and lived in the same area this area being southern Mesopotamia. So think of southern Iraq. At this time, people lived in a city, and this city was called Babel. And in the city of Babel, the humans there wanted to build a tower. They wanted to build a tower that can reach up to the heavens. Obviously, this is an impossible feat because heaven's not something we can physically reach. But to them, their human pride got the best of them. They wanted to build the best of the best that they possibly could. And so they worked together to build this immense tower. Now God did take notice of this and he looked down on the humans, basically just wondering why they would do such a thing and looking at their arrogance, basically almost scoffing at us, saying like, why are we bothering doing such a thing? And so humanity basically becomes scattered. God scatters humanity off to different corners of the world and teaches us different languages so that this can never, you know, happen again. And it's interesting, the word Babel actually means confusion in Hebrew. So you kind of see where that name came from. The confusion that spawned from the scattering of people due to the creation of the Tower of Babel. And now this chapter ends with the genealogy of Shem, and Shem is the son of Noah. And this genealogy ends with Abram, who later on in the Bible would become Abraham. And it also shows us too that Haran was Abram's brother, who had a son named Lot. So we have Abram, who is the descendant of Noah, and we have a Lot, who is the nephew of Abram. And eventually it states here that Sarah and Abram will become married and that they lived in the city of Ur, which was a city in Mesopotamia, and they would eventually move into the land of Canaan. Now something interesting to note here is that Sarah and Abram's relationship wasn't the best. In fact, one of the main issues that they faced throughout their entire lives was the fact that Sarah could not have any kids. And this does become important later on in the story as we continue to study Abraham's life. So now Abram is important because he begins the segue into the patriarchs. And the patriarchs, if we take away the modern connotation of the word, the patriarch here is essentially meeting the forefathers of the nation of Israel. And so it all starts here with Abram. And chapter 12 is kind of as well, not only the start of this patriarch uh, arc itself, but it's also the time when God's plan for human redemption begins. And we see this now with him blessing Abram and telling him that he'll be a father of a great nation and that all families on the earth will be blessed through you. So essentially what he's saying now is that God is telling Abram that Israel will come from him. That's who the great nation is. And that their families will be blessed through him. Not only the families of Israel, but all the families on the earth as well. And we get more of an example on this later on in the Bible with Galatians 3.29, when Paul says that if you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham, and thus God's promise to him belongs to you. And so that's what God means here, that all generations on the earth will be blessed through Abram, because it will be done through Christ. So then God then commands Abram to land, to leave his land of Ur and move into Canaan. As stated earlier at the end of chapter 11, this is what Abram does. But he doesn't just do it because Canaan's rich. No, Abram moves there because he does it out of faith. He trusts in God. He knows that God has his back. And thus, moving into the land of Canaan, a completely unknown land to him, wasn't that bad of an idea. 
And so he takes Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all the stuff that he owns, and he moves into Canaan. Now, once Abraham does reach Canaan, God tells him that this land will be given to his descendants. And we can compare this to another curse by Noah, that Canaan will be submissive to his relatives. So I guess kind of just a little Easter egg there. And so Abraham continues his journey throughout Canaan and ends up in Negev. And Negev is a desert within Israel, which other terms modern day Palestine, which is where Canaan is. And during this journey, I like to point out that Abram remained faithful the entire time to God, and he trusted in him during this entire journey. As stated earlier, because of the fact that Canaan was a completely unknown land, to Abram at least, and going into this unknown land to many people would be scary and many wouldn't even do it. But Abram trusted God. And this is the exact relationship that God wants us to have with him. And so now, when he moved into Canaan, a famine struck. And so Abram decided to take his family and move into Egypt. At the time, Abram was scared. He thought that Sarah's beauty would cause some issues. So he decided to lie. He lied by saying that Sarah was his sister and that he was her brother. And so this did work, in fact. Her beauty spread far and wide to the fact that even the Pharaoh got wind of her. And so he tried to win Sarah from Abram, but God sent down plagues to Egypt, which basically forced Pharaoh's hand. And the Pharaoh did eventually learn the fact that Sarah was his actual wife, not his sister, and sent him off with gifts and pretty much telling him that he doesn't want to deal with God again, because I don't know anyone who wants to deal with God's wrath like that. And so we continue on here with Abraham leaving Egypt and retracing his state steps into Negev. And this is the start of chapter 13 here. And so chapter 13 is it's pretty short in terms of just what it talks about here. Um, we see Lot and Abram pretty much split their land and split their riches. Because as we stated earlier, Pharaoh gave Abram gifts just so he wouldn't have to deal with them ever again. And so because of these gifts, they became very rich. And so Abram and Lot split what they had to each other and moved to different parts of the Middle East. Abram stayed in Canaan, according to God's word, but Lot moved into the Jordan Valley, east of Canaan. This was because the Jordan Valley was fertile and had enough land and good enough soil in order to actually make not only money, but food. And we see that this wasn't necessarily the right decision, despite the fact that we may see these great opportunities and they may look really nice and they look, look really great to our flesh. It's not what God wanted. In fact, we see this because of the fact that Lot moves into Sodom and Gomorrah. And so we, I just want to keep that in mind here, is that despite the fact that there would be hardships in Canaan, it would be better off that Lot moved into Canaan and kept true to God's word instead of taking his own way in life. And so we end up chapter 13 with God once again blessing Abram, saying that the land of Canaan will belong to his ancestors. And chapter 14 is also an interesting chapter as well, because we see a war breaks out within southern Mesopotamia between many different kings. This is exactly where Lot lives. So, because Lot got caught in the conflict, he does get captured. And so Abram, being his uncle, goes and recruits 318 men and rescues Lot. So now as we continue on and end up in chapter 14 here, we see that Abram actually rejects an offer from the king of Sodom. And this offer was the fact that Abram can keep all of the plunder he got from the war. But Abram refuses saying that he does not want to get rich off of the king's hand. And he doesn't want to give the king any credit for giving him all the riches that he got. Which shows that there is a humility to Abram, which God wants us also to have. And so that's pretty much how chapter 14 ends. But before I end chapter 14, let's go back and talk about Melchizedek. So Melchizedek is a name that many people who read the Bible probably have mentioned or have come across at some point. But I don't really think put too much thought into it. So Melchizedek, as described in the Bible, was the king of Salem and the priest of the God Most High. And 
who is this God Most High? Well, the God Most High is none other than the same God that Abram has been worshipping. This same priest was also given one-tenth of his wealth from Abram. And Melchizedek also gave Abram a blessing. So now, there might be more questions than answered now that who Melchizedek was, because he seems like a pretty important man. Well, as we begin to look into different parts of the Bible, we see that Melchizedek might be a form of Jesus Christ himself. And now, what do I mean by a form of Jesus Christ himself? Did Christ literally come down in the form of a man and Melchizedek and that kind of stuff? Well, yes and no. Most likely, if we're going to take this in the literal sense, Christ probably came down in the, as a form of an apparition of sorts. And kind of like how the angels come down with their bodies. And also to keep in mind too, when I refer to Christ, Christ is also God, part of the Trinity, which we'll explain later on in the series. So in a sense, Abram interacted with God in a human form, pre-Jesus. But we can also take this metaphorically as well, saying that Melchizedek is a form of a Christ-like figure because of the fact that he was a high priest and also the fact that he blessed Abram. And we can also use different parts of the Bible to boost up this claim as well. If we go into Hebrews 6.20, Christ is mentioned to have come from the priestly line of Melchizedek. And if we also take a look at Hebrews 7.3, Melchizedek is described to have no beginning and no end, and remained a priest forever. And so with that in mind, we can kind of see Melchizedek being a Christ-like figure. And so... As we continue on in our study here, with keeping that in mind with Melchizedek, with all these great blessings that Abraham has received and has yet to receive, he kind of doubts God here. In chapter 15, he doubts how great the blessings that God gave him, despite the fact that he doesn't have a son. And so God promises Abraham this, that he will d deliver him a son, and that no one in his household will inherit his wealth, because at the time, if he didn't have a son or a direct heir, a servant would directly get his goods. And so God says that a servant won't be your heir, I will promise you a son. And this is true, because God promises something, you sure that he's going to keep his promise. And then so God later speaks to Abram, reassuring him that his descendants will be numerous as the night sky above. This is important too, because this claim is also a claim that Israel, in the generations that will precede or descend from Abram will be numerous. And this is also hinting at the fact that there will be the 12 tribes of Israel. But God also reveals a darker side to this prophecy. He reveals that his descendants, Abram's descendants, will be slaves in Egypt for 400 years, but God will save them and will punish Egypt. And now Abram, after receiving all these great blessings and these visions, offers up sacrifices to the Lord to show his commitment and to show his honor towards him. And now, like I stated earlier in the beginning of our study in Genesis, is that God is not a pagan deity. So these sacrifices aren't just like a pagan sacrifice where they would sacrifice an animal in order to bring light into the earth or to make sure the winds blow. This sacrifice was just a way to honor God, in a sense. Christ would later come to make sure these sacrifices were null and void. But that's the reason why we see these sacrifices happening here and there in the Bible. And later on, once we go into Mosaic law, these sacrifices were a way to intercede in terms of sin. And now as we continue on here, we'll begin with chapter 16 in the middle of our study with Abraham.